Hello, DC Church. Welcome to Connect Group. Pastor Cal here today with Jim, Pastor Jim. Hello, DC Church. Good to see you again. And uh, we are talking about being saved as a Christian. So we're in Romans chapter 10. And this in your book is on page 77, page 77, being saved, okay? So we'll go ahead and we'll get into the lesson today. By the way, we're broadcasting from outside because it was too nice to be indoors. And I said, enough, I'm done. I rattled the chain, I'm sorry, that will not happen again. (laughs) Uh, So being saved, okay? So for the Christian, being saved has always been granted through? Faith. Faith, right? Being saved has always been through trusting and believing in God, which the Bible calls faith. Now, um, Romans 1 through 8, so we're in chapter 10 today. Romans 1 through 8 really explains the, the Christian understanding of what it means to be saved, what it means to be a Christian, and explaining how we are saved. And we have a problem with sin, meaning that we break God's law and that we're not able to get to God because we broke God's law, we have a broken relationship with him, but Jesus, he did what we we could not do. For anyone who breaks the law of God, there has to be punishment, and Jesus took the punishment on him when he died on the cross for us. And so that's the basic Christian message, and so Paul was speaking to an audience of Jews and Christians, and so, well, Jews who are now Christians, and than Gentiles, non-Jews who became Christians. And so he was trying to explain for the Jew, there's this whole part of the Bible called the Hebrew scriptures and God gives the law to these people. So what's the point of this Jewish law? And so Paul works that out through Romans one through eight. And we talked about a lot of that. And so we're just going over it now. So the practical application of believing and trusting in God is obedience to God's commands. So if God tells you to do something, then you do it. And we say that God has told us to do stuff through how he's made the natural world, for example. So there's like a natural order of things and we ought to follow that. He's also revealed what we ought to do through his dealings with the Jews. So in in scripture and what he's done. And so he also has written on our hearts right and wrong as well. So we know things, right? And so if God has told us what to do and shown us right from wrong, we ought to do what God wants us to do. It's just very obvious, right? So God chose to relate to the Jews through the law and the Hebrew scriptures. And by keeping the law in obedience to God, the Jew was expressing the fact that they trusted and believed in God by how they acted. But God built into the law the reality that humans were going to break God's law. They were going to sin. And when they do they're going to need to repent. And repentance happened through offering animals they would kill and would give as an offering to God meant to to explain that there has to be death, punishment, because when you break God's law, there has to be punishment. So that's expressed there. And so we as Christians think that, that God's law is brought to its total completion in Jesus Christ, that the law was pointing to him, the idea of animal offerings, the idea of a high standard of holiness and purity before God that no human could match, that Jesus was totally holy and pure before God. And Jesus was that perfect offering on the cross for our sins. And by his resurrection, we have the promise of resurrected life with God forever and ever. And that's the gospel kind of just spoken very quickly and briefly. So that's a Romans 1 through 8 recap. We're going to get reading today. Romans 10, 5 through 10. Since Moses writes about the righteousness that is from the law, the one who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this. Do not say in your heart who will go up to heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will go down into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. On the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. This is the, mes- this is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. There appear to be two ways that righteousness comes, okay? So Paul writes that that Moses wrote about the righteousness that comes from the law. And Jim, what does he tell us? He, he writes that there? the one who does these things will live by them. All right, so 
you believe and trust in God, right? You have faith, and God gives the law, so you, you do the things of the law, and you live by them very closely. But now, Paul writes, a righteousness, a way of being made right with God, comes from just purely having faith in God, so no human action, mm. like in the law. And so just believing in Jesus Christ. And so our tendency as humans is to, is to want to do what? But we want to try to earn our salvation, earn that righteousness. Yeah. yeah. We're, a, we're like a task-oriented people, right? So we figure we've got to be doing something to get something in return from it. There are people out there who just kind of go, just no judgment, live how you want to live, do whatever you want to do. Mm. However, most of the people I know, I, I really think, Jim, they want to have a legal code. They want to have a way of going, I'm right, I'm good, I'm a good American, mm. I'm a good wife, I'm a good husband, I'm a good parent, I'm good to the environment. Right. I'm, I'm good somehow. Yeah. I've made it. Yeah, and I, I think it gives us, we feel like we have some control, right? If, if we can be good enough, if we can do these things, be the good husband, be the good employee, then at the end of the day, we can step back and say, this is what I've done today. Right? The problem, though, is what? What's good enough? Yes. Who, who establishes the, uh, the, the measuring stick to measure what is good enough? And so that question tells you who is establishing the rules and the standards. And the answer is we are. We are. And so that's what Paul is talking about here is, is that you have a person who might say in their heart and like their inward spirit, you know, who, who will go up to heaven? Can I possibly make it up to God somehow? Can I do what only what Christ can do? Or who will go to the abyss? Can I, can I go to the, 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 the places beyond this life to achieve what, what only Christ can do. So in some way, somehow, could I as a human ever make it or do it? And the answer is, we all try to do that. We all try to be a, our own little God. And we even try so much that in a religious life, we make our own rules that explain our behavior, that give us rationale for what we do. And we say, I am good enough and I am right. And so the the, the argument against the person who's a legalist like that in Romans still hangs over us today. Each and every one of us were drawn to this because we are drawn towards a man-made religion. Even a man-made religion in the midst of God's church. Legalism is always hmm. right next to you. It's right around. It's always tempting you, pulling you towards going, I am good enough. I did it. But none of us can do it. There was no one righteous, not one. So very... Uh, to the point, what is the message of what is the message of faith that we as Christians proclaim? You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, right? Curios in Greek, not curious, curios. Okay, you confess that Jesus is Lord, and so if you were translating the Hebrew Scriptures into Greek, the word you would use for Yahweh for God would be curios. So an ancient reader of Paul's letter would have heard him claim, if you, if you confess, if you admit that Jesus is Lord, is, yeah, Lord Jim, which is yeah. God, right? right? Which is the God of the Bible. Yeah. And you believe in your heart that God in heaven raised him from the dead, you will be saved from your sins. That's the Christian message. And so, you know, what do you believe with at, at, at its core? Do you believe with your ears or your nose or your mouth? No, you believe with your heart. Believe with your with your heart, your the inner person, you right? Are. Yeah. And so this true belief in your heart has a result. It means you are righteous before God. But there's a tendency to go, well, I, I can be a Christian, but I can be a secret Christian. <laughs> and let me, let me let you in on a little secret right now. You can't be a secret Christian because if you have an inward heart change and you are a Christian, you believe, then you confess with your mouth. That's right. You confess, you live it outwardly because real belief leads to real obedience. And you can't be obedient if you, are, if you aren't living publicly, speaking with your mouth. So this confession isn't just a one-time, Jesus is Lord. It's a living a life that shows that you believe he's Lord, right? Yes. Yeah, it's not just saying he's Lord, I'm done, because then you become a secret Christian again. It's continually living out this life that says, I believe that Jesus is Lord. Yes. Yeah. 
It's like a garden you cultivate or, or weed. Maybe some of you have been out in the yard a little more than usual <laughs> recently, and you know if you don't cultivate your garden, then it gets weedy, right? So a, a real Christian life that displays the real Christian fruits of public outward like action, expression of what you believe. Not that it saves you, but it's the very proof that you are saved. Perfect righteousness through the law would theoretically require you to obey perfectly. So a Jew could never be right with God completely unless they kept the law flawlessly. But God seemed to know from the outset that this couldn't happen because he established in the very beginning, you can offer up animals instead of you being offered up. The animal takes the place of your, of your sin, really pointing to Jesus and what he would do on the cross. So, Paul here quotes from Deuteronomy 30, okay? And this is what is written. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask, who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask, who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it? No, the word is near to you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart so that you may obey it. We don't have to go to heaven to argue our case. We don't have to go across the, the oceans or we don't have to go into the grave to work out our resurrection. Jesus, by God's power, he took everything. All we do is we believe and trust in Jesus and we act on our belief. How might the idea of having to gain righteousness from the law be expressed today? Because I'm not Jewish and I don't have a law. So how do we express the so how do we like express that and live that out? What's the appeal of earning our salvation when we can have it uh, for free? So are there any ways that you kind of work towards life right now, kind of like a Jew would have worked in the ancient world to get right with God? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we, we touched on this a little bit, right? Like, we want to be a good father. We want to be a good husband. We want to be a good employee. And I guess the appeal of it is that we, we apply our own standards. Right? And, and I don't, as, as a believer, it's hard to kind of make sense of, of why we would want to do that when it's been offered for free. But I think... And going back to the fact that we just were doers and it's easier for us to say, well, I've done this today, right? We can look at our checklist and I've done this, I've done this, and I've done this. So it's kind of a, I guess there, there is an appeal to it, but at the same time, it's really kind of maddening because what's, what's enough? Right? Like we talked about, how much is enough? I could be a great guy, but my neighbor next door, he's done a lot more than me today. So who's setting the standard? The bar's moving, right? If I'm trying to set it myself. So I don't know. That's a tough question for me to answer because I think from the, from the perspective of a non-believer, we can say, or, or the non-believer can say, I've, I've done enough. Mm -hmm. I can, I'm right with God. But if they know the truth, then why would you try to even strive for that when it's there for free? Yeah, so there's, you see on either end you have temptations. You have to, number one is, I don't, I don't care who God is. I'm God and I'll, and I'll do whatever mm -hmm. I want. But then number two is, now that I'm a Christian or I have God in my life, um, well, I, I kind of like leave behind like grace when I first became a Christian and I kind of trend into, well, I'm really good at looking the part and I'm good at acting the part. And so you start to move away from having a relationship with God to kind of going, I check the boxes like what Jim was talking about. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is you move from a real, like natural Christianity into just kind of like a ritual or a habit. And so church is just a place you go and your small group is just a group you've always been to and you kind of lose the life behind it. And, and that's always a danger, right? So there's, there's a, a new kind of legalism that rises up in the Christian life, yeah. or that can rise up, you have to fight against. Yeah. So an example I was telling you, I've challenged our students to read their Bible every day, right? That could easily fall into a, just a, ch I've done this. You know, mm -hmm. Jim asked me to do it, I've done it. But there's a reason behind doing that, okay? The reason is because it grows us closer to God. It grows us um, more, in a, more dependent on Him when we make, when we carve out that time from every day. But it's, that's a perfect example of where something good that we should be doing can turn into um, just a checkbox, you know, if we're not doing it for the right reason. So students, if you're watching, that doesn't mean don't read your Bible, but what it does mean is you do it for the right reason. Mm -hmm. right? Do it because you want to draw closer to God. And yeah, even do it when you don't feel like it, because 
you know it's going to benefit you and it's going to benefit your relationship with God, which will in turn benefit others as well. In the That's world. right. Real organic Christianity, natural. Yeah. I didn't really like improve my grades in college. I did. I started off kind of bad, but really I just like improved at going to school. I, I learned how to go to school better. Yeah. But as far as like real learning, that didn't like really improve as much. And so that's not organic. That's mm-hmm. kind of the definition of legalism. Now I still learn stuff in college, but you know, <laughs> you always want to, you want to evaluate. Am I am I really doing this for the right reasons, or, or am I just reading the Bible to like check a box off? Mm-hmm. Reading the Bible is still good, but like Jim's talking about, read for the right reason. Yeah. Read for the right reason. So we're gonna read for the right reason of learning more from the Bible, from mm-hmm. Romans 10, 11 to thirteen. For the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So now that we see that you cannot make it to God by keeping some kind of law perfectly, and now that you see that all that is required to to know God is to trust in the work of God and have a relationship with him through Jesus because you, you trust in God, you believe in what he's done, and that all happened through Jesus. Then everyone who very simply believes on Jesus will not be thrown out of God's household, put to shame as the Bible tells us here because there's no distinction between a Gentile here called a Greek or, or a Jew. So there was always the tendency for Jews to go, I've got Jesus. And I have the Jewish law. And you Gentile, you just have Jesus. And you're never going to fully be right with God until you also keep the Jewish law. So it was kind of like you got into the club, Mr. Gentile, but you're not in the VIP room. (laughs) Now, I know that you, like me, do not go to a lot of clubs and VIP rooms. So that was a terrible illustration, but you probably heard of them and know what... (laughs) I'm talking about. So, uh, man, that was a really awful example. But the idea here is that there is no special higher level of being a Christian. There's just everyone who calls on the name of Christ, they are saved, okay? No distinction, no different classes on the airplane, for example. That's a way better example. Because there is one God, one Lord Jesus Christ, and he blesses all who call on him. Everyone who calls on God will be saved without distinction. And if that isn't throw away legalism and law, then I don't know what will, okay? So, what, well, and two, like Cal, the idea that we don't have to, we don't have to worry, right? We don't have to wonder, have I done enough? Mm-hmm. Uh, have I been good enough today? Did my next door neighbor, was he better than me? Did I meet up to, to the standard that he maybe achieved? We're free just to live. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, right? It was just this freedom and being able to live for Jesus and not have to wonder, does God still love me, right? That's mm-hmm. gone. As you said, um, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, will not be disappointed, will not be left wondering, have I done enough? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's freedom. That's true freedom. What makes salvation through faith in Jesus being offered to all so wonderful and so difficult at the same time? Hmm. Freedom, right? So so we're, we're we have freedom now from, from, from ever wondering, can I do enough to please God? How do I know him? Do I have that peace in my life? But at the same time, it's, it's a great freedom that comes with a great, you know, obligation to it, to live according to our calling, right? You know, I think sometimes about, you know, people that have, have like, you know, they've gone to war for this country and given their lives, and I feel embarrassed at how I, I waste my life mm-hmm. sometimes, you know, and I feel compelled to be a person of, uh, purpose and, and meaning. And I think that's the kind of the idea in light of what Jesus did for you. How can you just waste it? Right. Well, yeah. And, you know, and James wrote about this, right? Faith without works is dead. So there should be a change in, in us and there should be a change in how we live our lives, not to earn that salvation, not to earn God's love, right? But because there's, he's given us this responsibility yeah. to live according to his standards and to make this world a better place. Um, by pointing people towards him. Yeah, and, and just to just to be energized by that yeah. fact, you know, so and and that's you're gonna have bad days, but you gotta keep getting back on the horse of Christianity and riding off into productivity. Yeah. If you don't have a horse or have never ridden one like me, then <laughs> you 
probably relate to that example. But if you actually own horses and ride them, you've probably thought, Pastor Cal has no clue what he's talking about at all, and you are correct. <laughs> we're going we're to keep reading Scripture, though, now. All right, this is Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. How then can they call on him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are, unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. You know, we're saved, right? We're saved. There's no special level like I'm, I'm a Christian and I'm a Jew. It's just no distinction. We are all Christians about what, what Christ did for us and just believing and trusting in him. And now because of that, we should be prompted to live differently, right? Mm-hmm. And so if that's the case, shouldn't you want other people to have the same experience you've had and have a relationship with God and the richness of knowing him? But how can people, you know, believe in God if, if, if they don't know about him, right? If they don't hear about him, how can they hear without a preacher? And this is not a preacher with a capital P like Jim and I. This is a, a generalized preacher, right? It's like, you know, it's good to go to the, like, the hospital and the doctor for care, but the best person to be in charge of your health care is you. Mm-hmm. By, you know, being active and eating right and, uh, you know, watching your body for it, maybe be wrong or maybe be right and then reacting and responding to that. That's the way to live and then include the doctor in medicine when you need it. Mm-hmm. But how can someone hear without a preacher, okay? Lowercase p preacher, meaning if you don't go tell folks about Jesus, then how can they ever know him? So you are the most proactive agent of the Christian message in your own life because you've been changed. And people cannot preach if they're not sent out. So if Jim and I as pastors, if we don't talk to you all about what the gospel is, why it's meaningful, and why you should go preach and give you tools to do so, then we're actually doing a bad job by not giving you the tools you need to go and to be sent out with a plan and a structure to reach your friends, your neighbors, your loved ones. Yeah. The, um, I love the fact that like the reason we're here today as followers of Jesus Christ is because those 12 disciples were obedient to what Jesus told them to do, right? And then they told people, and mm-hmm. they told people, and they told people. It reminds me of that commercial, you may not remember when I was a kid, there was like a shampoo commercial, and like it would show like a woman, and she told somebody, and there'd be another woman, and before you know there's like 20 women's faces, and it would say, and so on, and so on, and so on, because they kept telling people how great the shampoo was. I probably just showed my age there. Well, but, that's uh, a, it, it's, wor- it's word of mouth marketing. But, but it's, so. Yeah, but, it's, but that's, that, and that's what we're, we're, we, we carry that on, right? We're part of that legacy of, of spreading the gospel, and um, you know, hopefully in 100 years or 200 years, there'll be people sitting on a bench like this talking about mm-hmm. they're here because we told them about Jesus. You know? uh, and it's just an incredible responsibility, but what a, what a privilege it is as well. And so, you know, you were not special. Uh, you know, you all had this power inside of you, this life changing you. If you're a Christian, you have the ability to go into, you have way more influence and reach than Jim and I ever do. You have people you can uniquely speak to, and that you can love on, and you can be Christ to them, and then talk about your, your Christianity, what God has done in your life, in ways that we never can, that like, like an online message or post or or like a mail flyer will never reach them, but you can reach them, that God can work through you. And right now we have just an incredible gospel opportunity with what we're going through um, with this pandemic. People are, uh, you know, they're asking questions and they're curious and they're wondering, is this tied into, um, you know, end times? They're wondering, just a lot of people just want to, where's God in this? They may mm-hmm. even be asking it cynically, where's God in all yeah. this? Where's your God in this? But they're still asking. They are, exactly. And they're, they're going to be willing to hear what you have to say. So man, We've got to take advantage of this opportunity um, today. Yes, yeah. it's it's when you get these chances, you know, we, you got to use them. So, how beautiful are what the feet mm-hmm. of those who bring good news yeah. and the gospel of Jesus Christ? The Christian message is the good news here. Now, I don't know about you, but when it comes to feet, uh, I don't really, you know, my initial response is not, man. They're beautiful. They're they're cool. They're nice. They kind of have a thing of like, uh, I'm happy I have them and I can walk on them. They tend to smell more than I would like, 
and I try to watch them very carefully because if I don't, the consequences can be dire for anyone in my family or nearby. <laughs> but in this context, how beautiful are the feet? A normal kind of ugly, nasty, kind of messy thing. They're dirty from walking around of those who bring the good news. Mm. And so a part of your body that you may associate with just kind of like not being very like attractive, the Bible actually tells us is so beautiful because it's the, it's the agent through which the motion occurs of you going out and giving the gospel of Christ to new people. And so that's what evangelism is. It's a good and beautiful thing, even your feet. And so in this way, we are all preachers. So I'm going to ask you the question, okay? I just kind of answered, but I, I want to I hear you say it. I want to think that I hear you say it right now. <laughs> what makes the feet of a person beautiful who shares the gospel. What makes that beautiful, their feet? The answer? Well, what do you think, John? <laughs> oh, I thought you wanted them to answer. Well, I do. Yeah. I'm assuming well, that you're answering yeah. the question it, right now. <laughs> well, it makes them beautiful because it's, it's going to change their eternity. And it's the only message that can change someone's eternity. Right? So, if this is life-changing for you, and then life-changing for others, then if you're doing this, guess what? You are an, an actual agent mm -hmm. of life change. And how significant or, or, or like more meaning could you have in your life than to be that person that brings someone to God, that then causes them, because of what God would accomplish in them, to have life change like you had? That's real meaning. That's eternal purpose. And so who are the, perhaps, you might call them the Greeks or the Gentiles in our, in our culture these days? Maybe the ones who, who don't look the part or act the part or keep the law, like the Jewish law, if you will. Who are the Gentiles in our culture? Not just like an ethnic way, but maybe who are the Gentiles economically or socially? How could you intentionally reach out to those groups this week? What could you do? Do you know a person kind of on the outside of the margins? I would say that you have a person who maybe isn't the first person you text or call, right? They're just not the person that you're most interested in talking to. They just don't come to your mind. Maybe you even find them kind of like annoying or boring. Mm -hmm. And so maybe you've gotten the idea that other people also find them kind of boring or annoying. And so in a time where people are only calling certain people or interesting people, this is a person kind of left to the margins. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're a person who has no church home and more importantly, uh, does not believe in Jesus. You could be that person to value them and to humanize them in the same way that Jesus on the cross valued and humanized all of us. Yeah, and that's exactly the people that Jesus associated with, right? The people on the fringes, the people that no one else wanted to, to be around. And uh, I think there's that call in our lives to do the same thing. Get out of our comfort zone and, and reach those uh, as you, you know, the marginalized folks, the people that, that maybe are, are tough, difficult to be around, not the most fun, but they need, they need this good news as much as uh, anybody. Yeah, so just kind of have your ears open, your eyes open, and ask God to show you that kind of person in your life, and then make an intentional effort to interact and reach out to them. Because, I mean, their eternity is at stake, and real life change for them right now is at stake. So um, we thank you for joining us for our lesson today about what it means to be saved and how there's no distinction between people or groups. We all come to God through Jesus and recognizing him as our Lord and our Savior and risen from the grave. But that cannot happen if we don't hear about him. So um, God bless you and we will see you soon for worship.